The year is 2051, and humanity is boned. So boned, in fact, that they must time travel to the past to recruit key people to fight against the machine race known as Sky- Wait a minute, let me check my notes. Ah, they must travel back in time to recruit key people to fight against the White Spikes by being dropped from the sky. There we go. So, in a mere 30 years, humanity would be brought to its knees by creatures that seemingly came from nowhere. Despite the valiant defense of Earth by the Homo sapiens race, the future population would dwindle down to a paltry 500,000 people left, with most animal life completely annihilated as well. A super predator that is considered to be an invasive species for a variety of reasons would touch down in Earth's ecosystem and eventually hatch and spread so quickly the entire planet would be knocked back on its heels and would never recover. Seeing the extinction level event, the future humans would riskily open a wormhole to get to the past to have their parents and grandparents aid them in the war for the future. If it sounds like this would be causing a lot of temporal time issues and conflicts, then man, prepare yourself. So in today's episode, we will be talking about what these creatures are, their abilities, what makes them successful as predators, and possibly where do they come from. And also, before we start, nobody's required to, but if you think you are subscribed and want to check, YouTube recently did a purge of a bunch of people from this channel, and I've seen it before where people with functional accounts just straight up get deleted off the channel for no reason. You know, who knows? Anyways, it's always a good time. But as per usual, up on screen or in the chapters, you will see timestamps. If you want to jump to the lore and morphology of the White Spikes, then you know where to go. I don't think I've ever been this early with a movie like ever, but it seemed pretty cool, so I figured, you know, why not cover it? After all, someone said that I was a mediocre movie review channel now apparently so hey let's do it so let's get to why when what amounts to basically being space herpes invades your planet and you have the ability to go back in time you actively search with all due diligence for where these things are coming from we open up our story with Star Lord falling from some purple clouds along with a ton of other people he seems to be one of the only few that actually falls into a pool now I'm no invasion coordinator but I would have to say that drop had to be maybe a little too much drop in it and as he gets out it's apparent that something is roaring in the distance but you can't hear it because these videos only ever have the sweet sultry sounds of my grating voice. Flashback to 28 years previous and we meet Dan Forrester. Arriving home at a Christmas party he's currently talking to recruiters about a possible lab job. As we get the standard dad working all the time yet he has a loving family type of thing going on we get some information that Star Lord's dad is out of the picture. Really seeing a lot of parallels here. As Dan goes outside to finish up the interview he is told that they are going with a different candidate thus crushing his dreams of working in the lab. Although how Having been a scientist myself, I gotta be honest with you, scientists can be the whiniest bunch of bit as he sits down to watch a soccer game or a football game because American football is football and not hand egg, wise fish. No! He talks to his daughter about how he shouldn't let her dreams be dreams. You know, supportive parent stuff. But, as the game plays on, out on the field, a portal appears out of nowhere and out walks 50 or 60 armed soldiers. A woman walks out and she immediately begins telling everyone what's going on. They're from the future in 30 years with an enemy who is not human, and they are about to go extinct in 11 months. We then get some info on what's happening. The world's militaries were immediately mobilized and only 50% were able to jump into the future, and after they were sent, only 20% returned, and even of those, a lot were gravely injured. Because of this absolute meat grinder people were being sent into, the civilians would be mobilized as well to be sent in. A world draft was enacted to call upon anyone who was deemed capable of jumping under very specific requirements. And people did what people did. They got upset, rioted, and started questioning why they should be fighting a war in the future despite it literally being a case of extinction. Like, I mean, yeah, you probably should just go ahead and fight it because at the end of the day, you're gonna die anyways. As Dan continues teaching his class, the kids there are a little upsetty about what's going on. The future appears to be something completely useless of preparing for, and as Dan asks the class what they want to talk about, one guy just like wants to talk about volcanoes, and this will be highly important later for almost no reason. But as Dan talks to his class, he gets a notification to report for the draft for testing. So this reminds me of that one movie where like they had to melt down humans for genetic material to save an alien race, and despite the sacrifice of that person, the aliens just sort of acted like elitist turbo douches about it. That's the sort of thing that happens here. Getting drafted to fight a future war means you probably have some questions, right? But pretty much everything you ask is a ignored by the soldiers testing you. They essentially tell Dan that he meets his end in seven years anyways, but then won't tell him how. So he's selected to fight in the war. So here's a question for you. If only 500,000 people remain out of almost 8 billion that are on the planet now, why would only 50% be capable of jumping into the future? Star-Lord mentions later how it might be because you don't want to interact with yourself, but that would mean when Dan is sent into the future, 99.37% of humanity would be capable of jumping at this point to fight because they would have already 
have been annihilated. But I guess that doesn't matter. But what does matter is that Dan's tour of duty will last seven days. A bio tracker is attached to his arm and it helps facilitate the jump as well as it counts down to when he is going to be jumped back. Also, we are going for the North Korean factor on this jump. If you attempt to remove the device from your arm, your spouse or child of legal age will be sent in your place. Again, what even is this? Like, if it's predicated on not interacting with yourself, why would it be okay to send the spouse or child? Okay, yeah, whatever. As Dan goes to talk to his wife, she starts quoting how little people come back. She says that they need to run, but with a giant tracker on his arm, he's basically stuck. Dan goes and sees his old man at this point to get the tracker messed with, but sometimes you just gotta have a good old-fashioned argument with your dad. He gets into a tiff with him because his dad doesn't trust the government and thinks his son is trying to entrap him. Not important, but he does have a bullet Mustang, which we'll see later. And if you aren't sure what that is, it's the 1968 version with the 390 V8 Fastback painted Highland Green. Excellent in most aspects, except it should have been a 1967. The ironic part, though, is his dad talks about financial issues, such as obtaining money, yet he has this thing which can sell upwards of $3.4 million, but I digress. Dan tells his old man to stop sending Christmas cards to his house, though. He doesn't get a second chance to fix things. Dan then goes home, talks to his wife, teaches his daughter how to dig a hole, and then he tells his daughter that he has to go on a business trip for about a week, and she deduces that he's been drafted. Then we get to the most screwed up process I've ever seen in my life. To save you the amp up talk, civilians get the most basic of training. And when I say basic, it's like, it, they just show them how to load and use force multipliers. There's virtually no training. It looks like the smart people are going with R force and the others are going with D force, which I think stands for decoy force, maybe. Seems a little screwed up. As Dan talks to his new friend, Charlie, they both figured out the reason they are older and in this group. As mentioned previously, it's because they're already gone in the future in some capacity, which explains why the people they are being commanded by are so young because they haven't been born yet. But here's how all this works. Time is a river. Imagine two rafts on that river. You can jump between rafts, but you can't jump before or after the two rafts. Now, I'm not 100% sure how this raft was established in 2021 then. You would think it would be established only in the future from its time of creation to the further future where it's operational, but I guess not. Maybe I missed something. Anyhow, they say basically it's held together by chicken wire and hopes and dreams, so that's comforting when you're being ripped apart on an atomic level to be thrown through time. One woman asks what they are up against, and they are told that if they knew, nobody would go. Also historically great. As Charlie talks to Dan, a facility in the future is under attack with the research team. If they lose this, then the war is lost, so a quick jump becomes necessary. As everyone is sent up and into the future, we get back to the beginning of the movie, but there is a problem. They were told they would be dropped probably about 5 to 10 feet above the ground, which, if you drop 10 feet, you can definitely still break bones. But rather than being dropped 5 to 10 feet above the ground, the group is literally dropped above skyscrapers, meaning most of the group is now toast from the get-go. Luckily, Dan manages to survive along with some others in his group as they look out over Miami that is completely destroyed. As they view a group from below, they see another squad gets annihilated by the creatures. Dan is informed by the colonel that they need to get the research team out of the building for search and rescue. Moving through, they end up finding the team has been annihilated and then they run into the creatures responsible. They are in a bit of a time crunch, however, as the entire place is scheduled to be scrubbed with energetic concussive force. Because the research team is now gone, they are attempting to find what the team was working on. As they search the building for it, the aliens have arrived once more. Moving into the stairwell, Cohen is the first to notice them above. After engaging in force multiplication, which appears to be doing very little unless you hit them in the abdomen or neck, it becomes a race to get out of the building and out of the area of effect. Also, straight up, Charlie has the most realistic reaction of any person ever being chased by an alien monster with razor sharp teeth. This man screams shit about like 120 times. It made me laugh. Anyways, eventually the team is able to make it into the tunnel after their caravan is completely ripped apart by white spikes. While jumping in, Cohen and Nora are both hit by spikes and stay behind as missiles are dropped into the tunnel that the team was trying to escape through. Several hours later, Dan wakes back up in a cot at a forward operating base in the Dominican Republic. Most of the team has been taken out at this point, leaving Dan, Charlie, and Dorian. Dorian is there because in a few months he ends up meeting his end via cancer. So rather than that, he wants to go out on his own terms, which explains why he decides to do it three times. After talking, Dan is being called forward by the colonel. As they talk, Dan realizes that it's his daughter as they share the last name. But his daughter isn't really all that happy to see him, which, I mean, obviously it's a little confusing, but sometimes with these movies, is anybody's daughter actually happy to see them nowadays? I mean, look at Army of the Dead, look at this movie, like, everybody's daughters just hate them. Anyway, she says that she didn't bring him here to spend time with them, she brought him here for a reason. So obviously he would have a few questions, and he asks what that reason is, and she's like, oh, I'll tell you when you need to know. Why? Just tell him. What is up with all the smoke and mirrors in this movie? Anyways, the remaining military has a plan. They have developed a toxin. See, they just tell you anyways. Like, literally, she won't tell him right there. They get on the helicopter, then she tells him. Anyways, they developed a toxin 
toxin to take out the males, but it wasn't successful on the female, which they are going to capture and figure out why. Okay, so again, here's the dumb part. Again, like the movie, but they have the knowledge that Russia is where the first outbreak of space herpes started, right? So rather than send people, I don't know, back and then work with world governments on searching Russia for whatever this stuff is, they decide, ah, screw it. Just send people into the meat grinder. I mean, in this situation, what would you do? Uh, maybe set up a freaking search team in a perimeter? What's the old saying? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure? How is Russia not locked down in 2021 timeline and massive searches are being conducted? Essentially though, all it took was three years and humanity was completely overrun. So again, would have been better for them to look. But Dan asks what happened to his family. And again, Murray is just super vague about everything. So at the female hive, the soldiers are attempting to bring this thing out, but it's not working. One dude gets completely bitten in half, which sucks. And Murray descends in to help while everyone is getting shreked. So this whole thing really seems ill-conceived. While they are down there and trying to subdue the female, more males arrive answering her calls. Before the female can eat Murray, Dan then jumps in to help and they are finally able to subdue the female, getting her in the cage. Okay, so this cage has got like giant spaces that are basically just bars. Uh, this thing can still shoot spikes out of its appendages. What's stopping it from just shooting everybody that captured it? Regardless, as the males arrive, they manage to extract the female as Dan and Murray get in a Humvee and then throw deuces as heroic music plays. How these things don't follow them is beyond me. They get to the beach where she pops a flare, which again, how does that not attract their attention? So now let me give you a synopsis of this, like this whole family thing. Murray is being super vague, but finally tells Dan that he left them, big sad boy hours, and everyone shares and cares, and Murray then tells Dan he meets his end in a car accident. Like, again, I get it, people go through changes in life, and life is tough, but uh, I'm just saying Dan doesn't really strike me as the bail out of the family type, and then he just does. Okay, so now we are in the Bahamas, and a giant structure that literally does nothing, and you'll see what I mean, was built out there. The best I can figure is the walls are for like maybe when hurricanes come through to stop the waves from destroying everything because they're virtually useless otherwise. In the lab, Murray has the female sedated and asks Dan to give her a hand with raising her up in the air. It is taking a ton of sedation to keep this thing down, meaning that its ability to detoxify its body is off the charts. So now we get to the lab section of this movie as well as family bonding because, you know, we have to do that. They're attempting to find out what exactly the toxin does and why it doesn't work on females, but it appears to be a genetic profile and that being different somewhat, which we will discuss later on as to why this is the case. Dan asks how they plan on getting the toxin to the deployment stage, but again, Murray doesn't want to talk about it till she has the toxin. Just tell us. Why is it so hard to just tell us things? As Murray continues working through the night on the toxin, Dan comes back to try to help, but Murray is predictably a bit of a turd Ferguson with him. And then she tells him the actual plan, which she could have just told him from the- okay, I need to stop complaining. Anyways, the plan is pretty easy. If the toxin works, he needs to go back and mass produce it and then send it back to the future as they don't have enough time here. How hard was that? As they fix their family issues, they have a 100% toxin match. But it just so happens the female now wakes up and calls out. And look at how useless these walls are now. They do nothing to stop invading males like at all. Although these could be invading females, which we will talk about. Dan has got seven minutes before he's brought back to the past. So it becomes a game of keep the meat suit away from the razor sharp teeth. Murray gets got through the back by a white spike. And as Dan attempts to carry her to the helicopter, that thing just nopes out of there. Probably a wise choice. So now everything has gone to crap pretty much. As the base bursts into flames, he realizes that he's not moving Murray anywhere. As they are attacked, he then reaches out to grab her as she falls into a bunch of white spikes. He jumps after her, but is teleported into the past before he can reach her. Hitting the ground hard in the past, there's a guy in the background missing an arm. What a time to be teleported. I mean, I guess it could have been worse. They're teleported literally for the last time though, because the base was destroyed. So that was their link to the future. But what's kind of stupid again is he has the toxin, he says he has it, and the lieutenant tells him it's over because they can't send anyone to the future. Okay, sure, but you have the toxin now. The toxin works on everything, so wouldn't it just become a waiting game? So despite literally having everything they need, the world is pretty upset and everything. They assume the human race is done and it's all set, again, despite having the literal answers to the problem in this man's hands. And I know, again, I'm complaining a lot at this point. Uh, I did like the movie, but it seems like to me this just, this isn't normal logical thought. Dan tells his wife about his daughter in the future. So get this, they figure out the issue that literally nobody else could figure out. And like, they literally do it whispering to each other for a minute. The year is 2048 when the first attack happens in Northern Russia. Betty asks, what if there's a whole fleet waiting for them when they get off their ships? To which Dan says, there was nothing. Nothing was ever found. So she asks, what if we're looking in the wrong year? I mean, gee, you think? Dan goes and visits Dorian at the bar and says that he needs the claw. They then visit Charlie to analyze the claw and he figures out that there is volcanic ash from the claw, which may be from China or Korea, which you aren't going to believe 
believe this, brings us back to that one kid who knows everything there is to know about volcanoes, and he cracks the code wide open as to where these things are. Armed with this information, they figure out the creatures have always been there, and it's global warming that released them. That's why it took so long as they dug up, not down, and were released. The group approaches the federal government, or really just this nondescript federal dude, who then tells them no, he's not sending them to Russia to literally stop what causes the human extinction event, so Dan is forced to ask help from his dad. Dan's dad just happens to have, I think this is a B-52 Strato Fortress, but I'm not 100% certain. Again, where's this man getting all this money from? But in the frigid Arctic circle of the country, as they make their way through, they eventually encounter electrical disturbances, finding the source of the human extinction in a day. I mean, in a day. They see a giant crater in the distance and know that's where the creatures are. Moving through an ice cave, eventually they gain access into a ship, confirming that these are indeed alien and not some ancient form of Earth life. Dan brings up that they have the proof they need and that they could leave now. But if they do leave, really the UN's just gonna argue with itself and everybody's gonna go extinct anyways. But he says that if they go in, really, they may not be going back. The group agrees that they need to do something because the government suck. So they break into it to put an end to the creatures before it even starts. As they move through, they eventually find the cockpit of the ship and discover aliens inside and they're not white spikes. They appear to have crash landed on Earth. Moving further through, they find the white spikes are cargo and Earth may have not actually been the target. They inject the toxins into the pods containing the white spikes as they begin to melt. However, in doing so, they awaken the rest of them, and they now start rigging the ship with C4 to blow the whole thing. As they continue fighting, they realize there's an entire colony within the ship, and they end up just blowing it up and taking out Dorian and the lieutenant. Dan and his old man realize that one with the red belly ran off, which I stopped for just half a second. Kind of sounds like the Snatchers from Gears of War, doesn't it? They even have the tail spike. I'm just saying. Anyways, tracking her down, it devolves into close quarters combat as Dan stabs it in the arm with a toxin, but it bites off its arm to stop the spread. As Dan's dad goes to sacrifice himself, Dan gets in close, cutting it with a claw before putting the toxin into the female's mouth, melting its skull. It falls into the icy rocks below, splattering itself, ending the threat from the alien weapon. Having saved humanity, nondescript federal government man takes credit, but it's all good because we see the bullet mustang in the background, then Murray is introduced to her grandfather as poetic justice ensues, and Dan doesn't have to make the mistakes he may have made in the alternate timeline. Now I gotta tell you, alright, I'm complaining, but I actually do think this movie is worth a watch. It was a lot of fun. So don't take me pointing out the flaws of it, meaning that you shouldn't check it out. It was sort of like King Kong versus Godzilla in the aspect that it was just fun to watch. I'm sure a lot of people could kind of use a way to unwind as of late. So I think the best way to kick off the science portion is to start with a question which I intend to answer later. Who on this planet is the most successful species? Who occupies the most biomass and has effectively conquered the planet? Well, I'll tell you, you may be tempted to say humans because of our technological prowess and population size, but you would be way off. White spikes are by design likely not naturally occurring creatures anywhere within the galaxy, but appear much more like a bioengineered super species. This is not to say that they couldn't exist, but there is a reason I believe them to be as such. Taking what these beasts are, how fast they reproduce, and how easily they can overpower most intelligent races on Earth, it's pretty clear that they are essentially what could be considered a super weapon. Because any naturally evolving creature like this would completely destroy a planet and then lead to their own extinction unless they have some alternative means of acquiring food, sort of like plants. It is hypothesized within the Tomorrow War itself that the aliens who were transporting these creatures inadvertently crashed with their cargo. It's really hard to tell exactly how long ago they crashed unless you listen to Mr. Volcano Kid. But if these things were released prior, they'd consume all biomass, are extremely territorial, capable in both terrestrial and aquatic environments, showing that these were likely meant to be intentionally dropped on either a planet the aliens were warring with or had intentions of clearing out hostile life forms ironically, and I would go with the latter over the former due to limiting issues. Well, they were used intentionally, not they just evolved. So there's this generalized thinking with humans that if aliens would want to take over Earth, that they would have to come down here and fight us, right? The reason is because ultimately we would turn to nuclear options, rendering large portions of our planet useless. But in reality, they don't really have to do anything of the sort. Either they could just turn a fast-acting virus loose on the planet, and we would have no way of defending ourselves against it, or they could really just drop a bunch of engineered hostile life forms capable of overwhelming us or really any enemy force quickly and likely that species wouldn't be willing to glass its planet for it seeing as it's an animal until ultimately it would be too late to do anything about it because the creatures were severely underestimated. So before getting to why I believe this is a self-limiting issue using these creatures as basically a strike force let's first go over their morphology really quickly to see what exactly we are dealing with in terms of durability and offensive capabilities. It should also be noted that there appears to be sexual dimorphism on display between the males and females on the planet which we will go over them and ultimately 
highlight why they are different. Starting with the feet of these creatures, they have two main sets with a pair of four limbs, technically making them quadrupedal as they use the back four legs to walk, and the forward limbs are not used in that support role. Their structuring appears to be somewhat digitigrade on the legs, but unlike Earth-based organisms, these creatures appear to have four joints, allowing for a greater range of movement and mobility. Below the lowest joint exists the feet. They're roughly about the same length as your tibia and fibula, if you are an average adult male homo sapiens. There are claws on both the back and mid limbs, as well as a dew claw that sits higher up that has been seen on some. And these can be used to grasp onto walls and completely eviscerate a human within seconds with very little issue. The hind limbs are used more for a supportive role, however they are typically used for locomotion, whereas the mid limbs are long enough to be slightly in front of the creature from time to time, where they can be used for offensive purposes such as shown by the larger front claws than the back claws. Think of it the same way as why cat's back claws are more blunted, whereas the front ones are sharper. The back four limbs, as mentioned previously, have four joints on them, each allowing for a greater range of movement, which in turn, due to how they move, also makes the creature extremely fast and able to keep pace with human vehicles on the ground. Internally in these limbs, I would say they have an endoskeleton as opposed to an exoskeleton, judging by the musculature that we can see underneath the white skin. On the back limbs, spikes are prevalent, but not comparable to the mid limbs, which have sharp spikes on the elbows for offensive capabilities, such as slashing when running by other species. The front limbs, or four limbs, are much like those of a praying mantis on Earth, having several spikes roughly about six inches or so, they can grasp prey. Although if they grasp a human, that's enough immediately to induce severe trauma and then bleeding, leading to a quick end. On the back of these creatures, there's several spikes for likely defensive purposes, either from their own or in general, so nothing can crawl on the back of them. I would say more defensive because the underside of these creatures are quite vulnerable to damage, whereas their backs appear, based on rounds that have hit them, to be more like a thick, callous material coupled with sharp spikes, rather than, say, like a brittle carapace. Jutting out from their backs, likely controlled by the spinal cord directly, exists a tentacle. These tentacles are capable of opening and firing a spike out of them at great velocity, which in turn can injure a person with a single hit and then incapacitate them, which we will talk about the internal mechanics of that here in a moment. Moving up to the face of the male white spike, or possibly female white spike, which we'll get to, they are incredibly ravenous looking. Their eyes are jet black and appear to kind of exist in a more prey orientation than predator orientation, be more focused on the sides of the head. However, this may be intentional as they can keep an eye on the sides of anything moving, but likely this is not completely on their sides. It's really just more to the sides and they probably still do have overlapping sight on their front. The mouth of these creatures are lined with random razor sharp teeth. One bite from this thing would sever a limb entirely. The mouth opens wider than what could be considered advantageous and appears really just to be associated with damage producing abilities. With all this, the creature is also missing its nose. It just appears to have what kind of looks like an open wound that appears to take an air from the surrounding area directly onto mucous membranes and because of this, it allows them to smell blood up to a mile away. So let's move on to the probable internal anatomy for a moment, shall we? Internally, as mentioned previously, these animals possess endoskeletons. An exoskeleton of this size would not be viable for how quickly they move, not to mention the muscle that can be seen underneath the skin is kind of a dead giveaway for that. The skeleton would be quite thick, more so on the head of this creature as it's able to take shots directly to the dome, very little issue of shrugging it off. They would appear to have a circulatory system of sorts as surviving on Earth with our oxygen percentage would not be viable for anything without it as the oxygen diffusion would not be sufficient to keep it alive. Not to mention these creatures appear quite intelligent, which is more pronounced in the female indicating that brain activity would have higher oxygen demands than that of insects and as a result a closed circulatory system is required. This system has been seen whenever Dan gets in close to the female and cuts her throat. The blood that comes out isn't just an amalgamation of fluids within the body spilling, but the rupturing of a system. Speaking of the system, what exactly are we looking at concerning this? Well interestingly, it is what is known as hemolymph. It's a greenish yellow blood that can be found in certain species on earth, which will lend credence to what we talk about later. The armor on the back specifically would be likely a layering of skin tissue found all over, and it's just built up here to protect it from attacks from humans and its species alike. The tentacles on the back would be something likened to our own esophagus, except instead of going towards the body, it ejects the spikes. The tentacles would be functional, like a long muscular tube, and with their proximity to the hypothesized spinal cord of this creature, it would be extremely easy to control, likely almost to the level of reflex rather than conscious thought. Seeing as spikes are found all over the body, this would be pretty indicative that the body just produces these in great quantities, allowing some spikes produced internally to be almost regurgitated out of the body through these tentacles and into potential prey. Now moving on to the female specifically, not too much is different about her specific appearance, apart from the fact that she is larger than the males or possibly, you know, sterile females, and more powerful. Able to bite a human in half with little to no issue and also double the size of the males and other females, it would appear that
that, this is the Matriarch. Covered in a thick armoring as well, this allows her to withstand even more damage than her male counterparts can, and she far outstrips the intelligence which we have seen exhibited amongst the drones, as she almost seemingly understands what is happening when she is abducted basically, and then seeks out revenge on Dan and Muri for entrapping her. Concerning hunting, these creatures are social hunters. They group up much like you would see in a pack of wolves and run down prey. They can communicate to one another by screeching with what appears to be orders given to move around certain obstacles and barriers. They also know how to flank prey much like wolves would and then push it into a trap. Again, this gives credence to their intellect. But okay, now it's time to talk about the elephant in the room on these creatures. Why are they here and what they may be related to? So again, I'll ask, who is the most successful species on this planet? Well, it's ants. Ants have an insane amount of biomass, hunt over large areas, exist on every continent except Antarctica, and have been around for an extremely long time, much longer than humans. If aliens were to come down right now and judge who was the most successful of all the species on this planet, it would be ants by a country mile. Which is exactly why I believe what happened in this movie is just that. I don't think it's a coincidence that the aliens just happened to crash land on Earth. I think they were leaving Earth and they had issues and then crashed back down to the planet. Taking into consideration of how these creatures look, operate, and the value offered by naturally occurring life on our planet, I believe it was a mission to bioengineer a super successful hunting weapon that was limiting in the way it could produce and reproduce and that it could conquer a planet quickly and if you left it alone for long enough, it would ultimately die out over the long term, allowing for the original species that engineered it to return back to that planet sometime later with no resistance. So what I think these things are are simply ants from Earth bioengineered potentially with other species or maybe even other species on this planet. Now, this could have been to wipe out all life on Earth or it could have been completely unintentional. We won't really know until Tomorrow War II at Boogaloo. But for now, let me explain why I believe this is all the indicators are really there if you look. First, ants too have six legs. Now this isn't literally the top indicator, but it shows that there may be some relation genetically between ants and white spikes. Ants possess four limbs that connect to the back portion of their bodies with a pair of four limbs at the front and they can be used to kind of grab what they want to and then bring it to their mandibles. Now clearly the white spikes do not have mandibles and instead have razor sharp teeth, which again, bioengineering appears to have been combined with them along with other creatures in order to produce this. Another physiological trait that points to me thinking that they are ants are the armoring on their backs. Certain varieties of ants have been known to have a layer of armoring specifically on their backs that when engaging in battle with other ants or insects protects them from being injured and losing the fight. So internally did you know that ants actually have a form of blood and you'll never believe what color it is. Greenish yellow. Much like when the matriarch gets her throat cut and it begins spilling out the contents of her circulatory system, the coloring matches almost exactly what ants have in their body as well which is why I specifically mentioned the hemolymph. Now again whereas ants have an open system this species would likely have a closed circulatory system which is intentional because this allows them to exist at the size they are and properly move oxygen around their bodies whereas ants that size would quickly suffocate under its own size. Again bioengineering. Another pretty good indicator as to why these creatures may be ants is how they can track pheromones and their ability to smell blood up to a mile away. When the queen was captured humanity was not only dumb for leaving spacing in the cage when she can literally fire spikes out of her tail but it should have also been airtight. I'm not surprised that the white White spikes were able to find the human base out in the middle of the Bahamas because of the pheromone trail that she was likely leaving behind. When ants seek out food, they will leave this trail for others to follow and for them to follow back. They are highly successful at picking up this trail when lost and should they find food, a huge portion of the colony will then follow that trail and subdue whatever food is there and bring it back. The white spikes were simply able to follow her scent as she was carried over the ocean and considering they are highly successful in aquatic environments, this led to humanity being wiped off the map in that time line save for a few stragglers elsewhere. This ability to track the queen and her pheromones is only compounded by the sense of smell these creatures seem to possess, which looking at ants again, the chemoreceptors allows them to venture out as far as 100 to 200 meters away from a colony to find food. Now taking into account how small an ant is, that's a massive distance for food. Extrapolate that to the size of a white spike and you will see they should be able to smell blood and pheromones really, really far away. But the strongest reasoning I have is how their society works and why this would be advantageous to the aliens to create these creatures intentionally for the conquering of planets. We know the white spikes have a single queen, and not just a single queen, but it would appear that the rest are either drones or they are females, but they are not the queen, so that being the case, their eggs are not fertilized. But that's just it. The entire colony appears to have come from just one colony, indicating that likely a colony of ants were captured on Earth and then changed into what we see. So the thing about a single colony is there's really only one that can reproduce in terms 
terms of colony continuation, which will be critical later. Ants owe this evolutionary pathway to something known as haplodiploidy. This also explains why the toxin that appears to work on the males, which are the drones, might not in turn work on her, which may also indicate that there may really be no females apart from the queen. But that would require us to actually check. Now in ant colonies, there are, most of the ants you see are female and the drones are the ones who reproduce with the queen, but it is still possible to consider this is bioengineered that we see just drones. Haplodiploidy is at its most basic core, a way for the queen to produce the viable young and pass along genes for said young through meiosis, which is a recombination of genes which produces genetic variability. Sounds kind of complex, but really it's not so bad. So the queen is diploid, which means she actually has two sets of genes, like how humans are diploid because the mothers donate half their genes and the father donated half of his. Two haploids come together to form a diploid organism. Now, when an animal undergoes meiosis, this results in a recombination of genes, ensuring that, say like some random disease can't come through and completely annihilate the entire population because there will be somebody who quite literally is just built different. This is how life evolves over time as these random recombinations are successful and they are passed down and then those changes go on and so on and so forth. Now the queen is diploid, meaning let's say that she produces four sets of eggs per laying cycle. Due to meiosis, those eggs are now haploid and need to be fertilized by a male with haploid sperm. However, it's not necessary for the eggs to be fertilized to produce viable young. All haploid drones are just big simps for the queen and basically just workers and then donating um, their genes. These sperm are reproduced by mitosis, meaning that they have the same exact genetic coding that the donor has. There is no recombination unless there's a replication issue. And this means that there's really, there is no difference in ants between their sperm cells and their regular cells. And this would make diseases quite successful in affecting them and their offspring if there was no genetic variability. Now, the queen's haploid eggs will be fertilized by drones haploid sperm, which with the addition of royal jelly produces a diploid queen once more, continuing the process. The other three eggs, however, if not subjected to royal jelly will become something else. The eggs that were fertilized in the absence of this jelly will become diploid workers capable of producing ants that can lay eggs. However, even with this, remember, they undergo meiosis when producing eggs. So those eggs that the non-queen produce will not be fertilized by the males, and as a result, all her eggs will become haploid workers who will go on to only fertilize the queen's eggs. Because any diploid female that creates only haploid eggs, those will become haploid males. This is why other female groups are not able to produce offspring successfully and ultimately their line, or at least their diploid line, will die out as only the queen has the ability to attract the drones to fertilize the eggs properly. This limiting technique is important, but ultimately what it does is control how many queens come about in the colony, otherwise the entire thing would fall apart and infighting would erupt if the colony was to allow this and this would lead to its own downfall. Haplodiploidy is the entire reason I believe ants were chosen as the species to be bioengineered to take over the planets. With this system set up, if you took a queen and her colony, made them larger, more aggressive, and with longer lifespans, considering it only took three years for humanity to be overwhelmed, you could change the genetics enough so that royal jelly would not be produced. And because of this, another queen would never be born. Without a queen not being born, you would still have the male drones fertilizing the eggs of the queen to produce more haploid drones. But another queen to continue the colony would never arise. Instead, you would have a fast producing army of males under a single queen's orders that occasionally a diploid worker would be born, lay her eggs, which in turn would produce more male workers, but never any more queens. Over time, eventually the queen would die of some event, whether that be old age or dumb luck, she's an animal and isn't perfect. The horde of creatures would live on for some time after the death of their queen, but without a way to reproduce, eventually their lifespans would be lived out or food would become so scarce they starve to death. Because of this, the aliens could return sometime later to a planet completely picked clean of life and build it the way they want with literally no resistance or threat from the locals as everyone has been eaten. Even the local fauna, such as with the horses running from the white spikes that we have seen. And my final point that indicates this is haplodiploidy that we are witnessing is the toxin and its ability to work on the colony. The males themselves genetically aren't very different from one another, but it may also be a process of lacking genetic coding that allows them to be resistant to diseases based on immunological functioning and genetic orders as indicated by the DNA. When you have something that's haploid, it may have all the necessary coding to survive, at least with insects, but there may be a critical problem if the gene is damaged or it just simply never existed in the first place. Take for instance, color blindness in humans. It's more prevalent in males than females and the reason is it's found on sex chromosomes, specifically the X chromosomes. Because males have XY and females have XX, when the gene 
gene on the X chromosome from say father is passed down, the mother may have a normal functioning gene on the X chromosome that she passed down. So the daughter having XX chromosome, one being the mutated gene and the other being the normal variant, means that her vision would be normal and no color blindness would happen. With males, however, if the X chromosome passed down has the mutated version, in this case from the mother, the Y chromosome will not have a copy of the functional gene, which means that color blindness will be present in that male. And this is why color blindness is present in males more often than females, because of the simple chance that likely a female won't have the mutated gene on both X chromosomes, whereas it's more likely for a male to have it on one of the X chromosomes that he has, because he only has one. Now, the same thing can be applied to the white spikes. It's apparent that this toxin causes the creature to melt down on males, but the female is capable of surviving. This along with the amount of sedation they have to use to actually keep the female asleep would mean that her body on the X chromosomes she has, assuming that she is of Earth, or at least partially, may mean in her genetic coding, she has a faulty gene for some enzyme production that would remove toxins from her body, but also has a gene in good working condition responsible for clearing toxins from the body. Now, whether this be an enzyme or just organ function is unknown, and it's never really stated, but with the functional genes she has, she's able to to resist the first round of toxin initially. The males having the haploid version may just run into luck of the draw. Seeing as they only have one set of genes that contain likely the faulty gene, this means that they could not survive the toxin entering their bodies as seemingly they did not produce the likely enzyme they need to inhibit the reaction that seems to completely melt their bodies. This would be why they had to design an entirely new toxin to overcome the queen and her genetic profile. The haplodiploidy would also indicate these size differences. With ants specifically, the queen is always large to help accompany the constraints of laying eggs and producing young. The genes within her body code for size increase, which is passed down to another queen, but drones do not have this size increase. Female ants sent outside the nest also do not enjoy this size increase either, which means it's specific pretty much to just the queens. Because of all this, I believe aliens touched down on Earth, found the true ruling organism on this planet based on biomass, secured a colony, and then brought it up. However, they had some issues with the ship for unknown reasons and the experiment they were working on crashed with them. Luck would have it that it was in a frigid portion of the planet which kept the creatures in a state of suspended animation until global warming would wake them back up and unleash them on the planet to annihilate the human race of that timeline.